Значит, я благодарна сегодняшним спикерам. Спасибо большое Клавдии Смола. And thank you very much to Claudia Smola, the first of today's three speakers, who helped and was instrumental in putting this seminar together and helped us to organize it all. And that's why I'll introduce Claudia as the first one. Claudia Smola graduated from the Philological Faculty at the Moscow State University. She defended her PhD thesis at the University of Tübingen on Chekhov. She's been a researcher and visiting professor at the universities of Greifswald and Konstanz. Then she taught in Humboldt University in Berlin. She had research fellowships in Jerusalem, Moscow, Barcelona, and Krakow. And in 2016, she defended her doctoral dissertation, which we will be talking and discussing today about its, particularly about its third edition, uh, because the first one was made in German, then it was in, in, in Russian. And actually tomorrow you will be able to order and, and purchase and, and order and receive the English edition. Uh, and basically our today's seminar is um, kind of focused or concentrated on that and just tied to that opportunity. Again, it, the, the book is called a little bit differently in different languages, and we'll refer to that later. It's called Inventing Tradition, Contemporary Russian Jewish Literature. This is the Russian title. Hello, Claudia. Thank you, Olga, and thank you for organizing and for inviting and so on. Mikhail Bezer, our second uh, speaker today. He's an Israeli historian and writer. In 1973, he graduated the physics and mechanics faculty of the Leningrad Polytechnic Institute. In 1979, he applied for a, for a perpetration to Israel, and then he kept getting refusals for years. He was a, an active participant uh, on the struggle to leave Israel, and uh, he led a home seminar on Jewish history and culture, was one of the editors of the Samizdat Leningrad Jewish Almanac. He conducted tours to Jewish historical sites in Leningrad and already in Israel. He's published books and, and uh, articles. I think it, here it's important to, to mention the Jewish University Herald. Where Mikhail was the deputy uh, editor-in-chief and in general, the Jewish University in Jerusalem, that is his center of uh, interest. Hello, Mikhail. Thank you, Olga, yes. And I just to remind that that I got PhD in Jewish history and in the and Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and and I edited the magazine Jews in Eastern Europe for several years. But we'll probably talk about that later. And our third speaker today is Marat Marat Greenberg. Marat Greenberg moved from Ukraine to the US. He's graduated there. And since 2006, he's been teaching at the Red College, Reed, Co Reed College in Portland. He's the professor of the Fed University. He's an author of several books that are important for our conversation today. A book about Boris Sutsky and the uh, the Commissar movie of Alexander Skolgov. And uh, his main book that we will be discussing today, it will be, it's, uh, it's about the bookshelves of Soviet Jews, what Soviet Jews read. Hello, Marat. Thank you very much for, for inviting me. 
it's a very early morning where I'm here. I'm I'm on this I'm on the um, west coast of the U.S. So if I get a little bit into mumbling mode, please forgive me. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for thank you for joining us at your 5 a.m. That you chose our company to to spend your 5 a.m. So then let's do this. Since we are talking about three different types of work today, I have certain several issues here personally. First one, which we've already faced before, because not at all, not at every seminar that we had. The dissident movement is not a very apt term, even though the, this is the general umbrella. So we've had this question before in when we spoke about the underground culture. Is this term applicable for the underground movement? Here, we will also uh, leave this in the air to discuss whether this is a correct term or not. And second, Second, we always would like the subject of the studies and research to be distant from the object, uh, but I'm afraid that in, in this at this occasion um, that it will be hard even for me personally, because obviously when I open the book, the book of Marat, and and I'm immediately responding, no, we had a different bookshelf. I'm com I'm very very adamant about that. So let's. Because let's thank you to Mihail, first of all, who uh, offered two articles, which I was able to send into the mailing list. And and I, I managed to send it uh, where where I could. All those both of those articles are available publicly. So the two books that we are um, well, the two other books, they are quite new and they are not publicly available yet. Thou, thou, I of course um, remind you again that the publication of Claudia was already available in other languages. So, if I, if I may, I'd like to ask all three of you to introduce your works, and then, and then we'll start a more detailed conversation after that. Claudia, if you, if you're ready to start, please. Well, yes, of course, of course, the title speaks for itself. I would say. Uh, in the center of my attention, I have the problems of reinvention of Jewish traditions. And for me, this is important in the post-secular framework, uh, for post-secular moment in history. I indeed have shifted a little bit the title of my English version of my, of my book, because the Russian title sounds very comprehensive. It says, it's it sounds too large uh, contemporary russian jewish literature and i of course mentioned in the work that i'm i'm not way in any way um can uh, com put everything there all the authors so but i re re um, i call the different in, in english it's called from soviet underground to post-soviet deconstruction of the jewishness and so i think it's it's imp it, it is okay to to include that book in the conversation today and the on the dissident movement it's what's important to for me as well what and you war warned me that we speak more of methods and approaches and perspectives rather than the history itself so in my, in my approach what is important is the differentiation between because the dissident movement is very different, it's very diverse, and the underground movement is all underground is also very large and very different. But when we, when we're talking about dissidents, uh, dissidents, it's kind of presumed that we're talking about the confrontation with uh, with the um, with the regime, with the authorities, while underground is more heterogeneous. Um, include and in, in, and quite a few of the Jewish authors. They existed in their own world, in their own niche. They were not interested in confront, confronting the authorities, and their form of protest was actually to not just participate in this official culture. And that was important for me to underline that 
that when we try to avoid the dichotomy of of being in favor of the authorities or against the authorities, there can be other options as well. Um, thou, thou underground the, uh, the is is a is a good metaphor and it's and it's an important metaphor. I Mikhail will share more today. Um, uh, for example, the story of learning uh, learning Hebrew and just studying the Hebrew sources and was unofficial and could not even happen on a more official level. So in, in the center of the attention of my literary studies work and from cultural logical perspective, this, this question is the most important, how the Jewish tradition was reborn in the in the in the situation the context of the accomplished assimilation of Soviet Jews I'm not claiming that all of the Jews have were assimilated that's not true and there were of course um, there were living uh, living connections to the Jewish traditions at the same time most of the Jews learned the Jewish tradition uh, through written sources by uh, because of having been already Sovietized basically and and because their grandparents uh, already have departed from the tradition uh, because of the revolution and so on so um so as part of this revival of Jewishness in uh, Soviet society how much was this a uh, media mediatized phenomenon when I'm using this word mediatized what I mean is that it has gone through secondary education, through learning of the uh, studying the sources, which were not very easy to find in Soviet Union. Nevertheless, the people use different sources and different channels for that. And so, one of my this is one of my ideas is that that there is a lack of diversity and comprehensiveness of Jewish sources in the Soviet Union, and that it led towards having a very eclectic revival of Jewishness because it was focused and based on to the to the only sources that were available so we can't really claim that there was a consecutive and coherent Jewish education there that's one point a second point uh, I'll, I'll try to crystallize some more important key points for me So studying the form of medialization, uh, what what kind of visual sources were available, textual sources available, uh, what was the available connection to the living t witnesses and and native bearers of Jewish traditions, and how it led to the creation of certain kind of mythology of Jewishness. I think this is one of the key point of cultural deconstruction that I'm uh, using as a method in my uh, works, because Aliyah was an immigration to Israel, which was a strong political pheno phenomenon. It led to a certain mythology happening in the cultural sphere, because Aliyah is a moving physically, geographically. Repatriation was considered by many by many, well, many, no, a minority, but the, the underground, so the culturally um, culturally produ productive members of the underground. I and mean, can't, we, confu we can't confuse it with the group that in fact immigrated to Israel, to other countries, many did go to Israel. Um, quite a few um, became uh, uh, religious Jews. But it, it, it was transformed in a sort of a myth that when you when you move, when you go into Aliyah, this is kind of your ascension ethically, morally. And my my work shows that the Jewish, that the Jew, that the Star of David was in a way ideal, similarly idealized as it was idealized, as the Red Star was idealized. So like Moscow was the um, the focal point of the new human beings of the Soviet type in the revolution and the culture of Aliyah, the so the the Magandovit, the Star of David, was a mythological, mythologized, symbolic um, 
a similar component uh, was so the, the Aliyah in general was kind of based on uh, ideologized mythological component. And my last point. The question that we were considering today, which is coherent to other meetings, so we had in the, in the series of seminar, the relations to to the dissident movement, and I have two limitations here. I'm talking about literature and not the whole uh, human rights defendant movement, and I'm also speaking par particularly about what happened in the Jewish underground circles. And here I'm referring to something that others have already written before me, Nazaris and Veranelli, who separated themselves from the human rights movement. And they said openly, well, for example, the famous quote saying that, why do we trans need to transform a country and try to improve and reform the country where which, which we really want to leave, in fact? And here, uh, it, what is important is the spiritualization of um, Israel um, as, uh, in, um, and, and, and the fact that the Jew, so Soviet Jews who were captivated kind of in, uh, in love with those ideas, they, they stopped considering themselves being part of the uh, Soviet and Russian history, but they started referring to them uh, themselves as part of history of the Bible and of Jewish nation. So in many the thousands. So they, since the 60s, they stopped considering themselves just like Soviet citizens, but they were, they were Jews in exile, Jews Kalota. And the Soviet Union, there was not a, Soviet Union was not a, their homeland anymore, but they, it was their Egypt. It was their captivity. I'm very, I'm, I'm putting it in very simplified terms. But these are kind of my key points from the book. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real shame that we're not starting with questions. We will first give each speaker a chance to express their views. And I would like to turn it over to Marat. Could you tell us about your book? Then you can say whatever you want to say, and then I will pester you with questions about identity and so on and so forth. Thank you very much. There are many parallels between my book and Claudia's books, and Olga says, yes, let's talk about these parallels. When uh, Claudia was talking, I had several thoughts came to mind. My most recent book, is what you're referring to, but I'd also like to mention my previous book because it was quite different. The things that concerned me earlier in my books about Boris Slutsky or about the firm of Askoldov, it or in my dissertation that I defended in the Chicago University uh, that was about Mundelstam, Slutsky and Brodsky and the Jewish poetry in the Soviet Union, what I was interested in is the creation of the Jewish voice in Russian in the Soviet context, primarily in literature and furthermore in cinema. But my most recent book, which I will show you now, The Soviet Jewish Bookshelf, this book is a much broader view. It's a culturology exploration. It's almost like an excavation. And this is what I was sharing with you before we started this conversation. Uh, we talked about Roskis's term, usable past. A past that you can use, something that's useful. And in my book, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to uncover this usable past for Soviet Jews. That's the kind of excavation that I'm working on. In the book, I explore and reconstruct the world after Stalin in the Soviet Union. And um, I use the bookshelf um, and talk about how the choice of books um, helps preserve self the self-identity of Soviet Jews. And this identity is 
uh, and this uh, knowledge base, the Jewish knowledge base, is fragmented and yet profound. Uh, we talked about assimilation or non-assimilation, whatever you want to call it, but in this kind of atmosphere of assimilation, the question I'm exploring is how does Jewish knowledge exist? How is it disseminated? And how does this fragmented Jewish knowledge shape the identity of Soviet Jews? In my work, I use two images, two ideas. The first is the image of the bookshelf of the parents. Um, let's say, in uh, Mandelstam's works. Um, Mandelstam writes about this bookshelf. He talks about different levels of this bookshelf. So a bookshelf is a sort of geological structure. I use this image and apply it to the image of the Soviet bookshelf, uh, the bookshelf of a Soviet Jew. And I try to identify what the levels of these of this bookshelf would have been. For instance, and of course, there can be debates about, well, and that's what Olga mentioned, which books um, stood at which level, and uh, geography played a big part, generational differences. because there was no Soviet Jewish community, as it were. So it was quite challenging to recreate a whole picture. But as research, as my research has shown, it is possible to shape this picture because we can talk about Fitfankov. We can talk about the translations of Siddish, um, of translations from the Hebrew language that were created in the 60s. Of course, we are talking about the canon of the Soviet uh, Jewish canon about the Holocaust, uh, Edinburgh, Grossman, all the things that were published back then. And I think Olga will ask me a question. Uh, the main trait of this canon about the Holocaust is what I call what is called multi-directional memory. How the heritage and memory of the Holocaust intersects with memories of Holodomor, gulags, and um, famine and other tragedies. The other another level in this bookshelf is propaganda literature. And here we are entering a very interesting zone because as such, I am not interested in the dissident movement, not in this research in particular. Uh, and I'm talking about dissidents and uh, human rights, uh, the human rights movement um, in the narrow sense. I'm interested in the difference between the mainstream and counterculture. So this is a, uh, I love the term that Olga uses, the dissident library something that was shaped, this self-identification of Jewish people that shaped so gradually. And on the one hand, we have something that is allowed, the books that were published quite officially. That's on the one hand, but on the other hand, the attempts to shape themselves and present a voice that spoke out against the regime, against the authorities, against those who refuse you the right to have that identity. And it is certain that in that zone, there was a lot of room for compromise, and many attempts of fitting in with the regime. I mentioned Malin Stamm. And on the other hand, we have Leo Strauss. Um, a German philosopher, a Jewish uh, political scientist who leaves Germany after the rise of Hitler and uh, spends his life teaching at the University of Chicago. And he talks about reading between the lines because the texts that are created in a totalitarian regime, there are two layers to them. 
the first layer that is accessible to all, the exoteric, and the layer that is only available to the few, to a few, to those who can uh, find figure out the key to understanding it, the esoteric layer. And this idea of reading between the lines is very important. In my book, and the things that Strauss talks about is about survival strategies. Reading between the lines, reading the scriptures between the lines is a survival strategy, especially in a totalitarian regime. So it's about survival rather than dissidence, rather than an open protest. That's what I see in the Soviet Jewish context. And this was a bit of a chaotic introduction, but I believe I managed to cover the main point. Um, I heard the word resistance and survival. Perhaps this is where identity comes in. Certainly, it is about identity, because you don't necessarily have to resist, you don't have to fight, but you can uh, fight for your right to, uh, to be yourself. But of course, if you consider the Soviet context, Jewish identity, shaping of the Jewish identity, you do have to present yourself. And that is a, a form of resistance, of course, but we can talk about different levels of resistance. But if we take, for instance, propaganda literature, literature that was created within uh, scientific atheism, uh, talking about the professors who lived in Leningrad, Mikhail Shachnovich, for instance, people who wrote books about the reactionary nature of Judaism, about the um, downfall of the Jewish religion. These people were using this Marxist Soviet language and applied it to religion. By the same token, they consciously, uh, in particular people like Shachnovich, wrote, consciously wrote between the lines. So they were creating these two layers, the layer that was available to all and the, the layer that was available to the few. They were able to convey something about the Jewish culture, Jewish history within the framework of scientific atheism. Um, that considered all religions to be opium for the masses. And in the same way, literature, that if it, uh, if it is read within, with, uh, outside of the context of the Soviet Jewish uh, bookshelf, may just look like propaganda. But if you look deeper, there may be something else going on beyond, below the surface. And my exploration is about whether there are these books that do have that additional layer to them. I believe it's crucial to pay attention to the context. Context is everything. And to a certain extent, that is true. Undoubtedly, there are those who would read this literature, including Jewish people who would not read between the lines, would not read into the esoteric meaning of it. And it's quite difficult to separate one from the other. But the final thing I want to say is that if we are going to be discussing those writers and artists that Claudia is talking about or the material that Mikhail is writing about, those people who became dissidents, who left the bounds of Soviet official Soviet literature, they also read the same books that Soviet Jews would have on their bookshelf. So the sources would be the same, the, the same Pitvanger leads us to this kind of open resistance and dissidence. Thank you very much. I apologize to Mikhail that we are a, a bit uh, stuck here. Uh, Lazar Krachtenberg wants to say something. So we're going to just step out from our scenario for a moment and do that now. <laughs> 
У меня такой общий вопрос. Yes, thank you. I have a rather general question, maybe to direct the discussion a certain way. It seems to me that that a Jewish literature is first of all focused on the Jews. It's it is for the Jews, and the Jewish nation, when it created, when it produced uh, its work in in dozens of uh, lit, uh, dozens of several dozens of languages, over forty literatures uninflected by by. Uh, there is, and some of them are significant, like uh, li significant, like Ladina, or, or, like great literature, like Yiddish, which in no way is inferior to many European, Spanish, English, or Russian literatures. All of these literatures, and I, I'm saying this with sorrow. Maybe some of these literature, all of these literatures are leaving this world because they are not preserved in Hebrew, like the literature in Aramaic is. So for me, the question is to those who want, would like to take this topic, what, according to you, in the Jewish literature in Russian language can be of interest to the Jewish nation in in to the degree that it will that it will be translated or those elements those works will be translated into Hebrew and will be preserved for the usage of the Jewish nation because everything else be, be, the everyone less is just face oblivion for the Jewish nation that's my question thank you very much the Who's, who who would like to take up on this question and answer? I, I think that, that what is of interest for the Jewish nation in, in the history of Russian and Russian language Jews, the, the specific elements are of interest for the Jewish nation which were, would have not been covered anywhere else except for Russian language space. And maybe this is worthy of preserving for the, in, in, in the treasury of uh, the Jewish nation, meaning in Hebrew. Clav Clavis, Clavis says, I don't have an answer, Marat. It's a very complicated question. I would say that everything is important. And we try to preserve everything, and some, that is something I'm I'm trying to do by means of my book. But everything goes into oblivion in a way. You can see face Facebook photos. I, I was several weeks ago in Israel, uh, and and you and you walk around and you can see the books just lying around on the streets and. Um, and quite a few of them are in Russian, actually. But in order to reconstruct and 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 perceive what was the world of the Russian or Soviet Jews, uh, or some other Jewish uh, sub uh, sub community, it's important to preserve everything, all of those texts. Of course, we can construct a hierarchy of what is more important, what is less important, what should stay and on and what shouldn't, but but quite a few of the authors are already part of the canon uh, of Jewish um, literature. First and foremost, uh, Babel, who, who was translated into Hebrew, Bashansky, and he considered uh, Babel to be, a, Goldberg considered Babel to be um, a deeply Jewish person, and that some consider even Babel to have been writing in, Jew, in Hebrew and then translating it into Russian. But um, from those whom uh, I write about and those who have become the canon of Jewish literature, Russian Jewish literature, Soviet Jewish literature, the ter we can discuss the terminology. It's up for debate. Edinburgh Grossman, Friedrich Gorenstein, those writers that Claudia is writing about, I think we can, we can give a long list. But what is important 
as I already mentioned, to 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 perform this excavation, cultural excavation, try to preserve all of it in in order to understand what was the life of that time, what was what it what were its sources of what what nourished it. I'm apologize to Mikhail to to make a digression uh, and and our conversation on the works. So, Mikhail, now the floor is yours. Please share not just the the work that I announced in the beginning, but also your article on the specifics of the Jewish movement. From the, thank you for giving the mic to me. I'd like to to relate to the previous conversation. I really like the book. Of um, of Claudia Smola, um, I've sh to I don't agree on everything she's wrote, but I like it very much. So, and the book uh, shows her brilliant erudition and and uh, her um, analytical capabilities, and it's a long-lasting heritage and legacy of the book. The only and the only uh, uh, comment I would say we say Aliyah, not Aliyah. So the accent, the accent is is wrong, and I I completely agree that the dissident the dissident movement and underground are different things, but if we consider that the Soviet regime was a very harsh one, and then uh, quite often it happened that someone who just wanted to live outside of the system, in the end, ha were forced to become. And up, you know, to stand in opposition to the regime, even if he didn't want to, that happened um, for Jews, or for other Jews, or for uh, the Jewish question or other issues. There, there was not much air in uh, uh, where you could just be your own person. If you pretended, uh, if you uh, had any aspirations uh, serious, you would you were kind of forced into being in the position to this day. Now about the mythology, I don't really like that word. But indeed, there were different people who joined, who became members of the Jewish movement. There was those were who were reconstructing uh, the Jewish tradition. Those were children of in, in Moscow and Leningrad intelligentsia, though not all of them, of course, but the there were the people from rather higher classes in the social hierarchy. But the Jewish nation was present not only in those stratas. And uh, Russia is not just Moscow. The Jewish nation is not only the rest of the intelligentsia, so we have to remember this. It's, for example, those who lived in Kishinev had different kind of fruits. They had a different journey to their Jewish identity and Jewish uh, movement. And even in Leningrad, for example, my grandmother, she 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 observed the tradition. She had mezuzah, she observed kashrut, and I I have memories from my childhood of participating in a Jewish fe feasts and celebrations. And I'm not that old, so. Um, So not all everyone had the same path and journey, and and for some it was quite an organic journey. They they knew what Judaism is about, what is a Jewish life, uh, a Jewish shtetl life, and so on. Now, to, a short comment also on on what Marat said, because I I cannot comment on Marat's book. I haven't been able to find and to read it. But my personal comment here is that this Jewish bookshelf, that it can be different of sizes. It's an accordion. It really depended on who who that the owner of the shelf was. It, it's very hard to say that there's an average shelf that we all read all of this. Like we all read this, but we never read that. That's an, that's an assumption that is too strong. Because books were one of the privileges in the Soviet Union. Through the books, people uh, learned the, of the world, what they wanted to wear and where they wanted to travel, what they wanted to see. 
that they were not allowed to, but the books allowed them to partake of that life. For example, if I wasn't able to subscribe and receive the fake fungus um, uh, works, and that's why I wouldn't be able to read the Jewish war. To take work. I'm sorry, got a phone call. I wouldn't, no one would share this book with me out of their collection of works. So you needed connections to, to subscribe to the, that, uh, that series. So everything seriously dependent on your background. If you knew Hebrew or Yiddish or even English, your bookshelf grew immensely because uh, you would have if you have other languages, then you, you have access to non-censored books. If you have access to some, that it's more. If you live in Moscow, that's one. If you live in other places, that's different. As Marazzi, you said that there was no structured community and there was no community um, community library standard. And uh, I guess at least I, that's when I studied you. But in Leningrad in the 80s, there was in a, a community of sorts. And there was a library of that community where, where they preserved, where they managed to gather the pre-revolution books. And that, that was an important library for those who studied, uh, who seriously studied uh, the uh, Judaics. And even Moscovites didn't have access to that because most of the pre-revolution Jewish um, uh, books were published in St. Petersburg, and the Moscow community was smaller, and they didn't manage to preserve, purchase and preserve those books, while it was preserved in St. Petersburg. So there, there can be more, more examples. So the, uh, the question of the bookshelf, it's extremely interesting, but we, but we have to remember as whom are we talking about? If I had connections in a, in a party committee that I would have been able to subscribe the UNIST magazine. And and then I have uh, the, the certain authors available. If I didn't have anyone there, I even 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 the ma magazines of its time were not accessible to public, uh, to wider public. You had to have some connections. So um, the whole country was based on privileges and elites having access to uh, things inaccessible for others. Now. Now about my works, my articles, a few words. In my second article, which is called Jewish uh, National Movement in the USSR and the end of uh, 60, late 60s, the 80s, what were its sources and reasons and uh, essence. That article went, uh, became, uh, became part of the story uh, the, this volume of story of the jewish nation and i and i thought a lot we are preparing now a volume on the jewish movement in leningrad and for me it was very important i'm not a conceptual writer but it was important for me what what was that what what their experiences what i studied what my co comrades my friends shared what that what was that in reality and i try to formulate it in my article so in two words just very shortly so what we're if we're talking about the jewish dissidents as you all use the term now I, I i don't use this term this is not my term but if we used it what i understand as jewish dissidents movement i understand those i see those jews who stand for jewish national interest so they have some particular Jewish agenda, at least as the way they understand it. So um, even though there is, uh, there were quite a few Jews in the dissident movement, some of them were baptized, um, but they are not a Jewish dissident movement. Like Paris Pasternak was a Russian writer, not a Jewish, even though he was uh, born as a Jew. So we can discuss this, maybe not now, we can we can discuss why there were a lot of Jews in the in the dissident movement, but that's not our topic for today. But if we're now talking about the Jewish movement, 
in early um early and, and late 60s it was a Zionistic uh, underground there were convinced Zionists and idealists but at a certain point it start started to become a, um, more um, from massive movement and it became a movement to uh, for, for for advocating for the right to leave to Israel and Jews of course based their this movement on the on the declaration of human rights uh, so in uh, and and then Helsinki declaration uh, Helsinki movement so in, in the so in a way they were human rights defenders but they on the level of their declarations their primary interest was the right to leave for Israel um, and now there is a difference between the declarations and the real work. What was the connect? Was the connection strong with the dissident movement or not? Some of the um, members of the Jewish national movement they started as human rights defenders. Let me give an example. You, everyone knows Moscovites, but Grigory Konovich was not a writer. He was an activist from Leningrad. He started as a dissident, then became uh, departed from this movement and became uh, um, a Zionist. Partashnikov, uh, Hefetz, and from Leningrad, from Kiev, and everyone. They, when they were arrested and became uh, prisoners, uh, they became sentenced in, in prison quite often. They most of them were imprisoned for anti-Soviet propaganda, but they became some. One of them became at the same time a Zionist and a Ukrainian nationalist. In a way, Eduard Kuznetsov, after his first uh, term in jail, he also became a Zionist. So quite a few of them were Zionists by just by nature, we can say. Silvus Amundsen, Efrem Riga, Mendelevich. Quite a few of them never had any connection to the dissident movement. They they just had their own agenda. David Shenglas in Leningrad. I'm not sure he joined the movement in the end, but Hilary Bultmann was also one of the names we can mention. So they they were quite numerous, and they 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 were only interested in the in the Jewish uh, issue and uh, agenda. And in so in in a way they were they are dissidents as mu as much as you can say that like germans of the volga region are dissidents or some other national movements and of course they did work together with the, with the, uh, with the, with the uh, cooperation with the dissident movement they had to learn something from the human rights defender they had connections with the west with the foreigners Vitaly Svichinsky was a major figure in the Jewish movement in the 69 and 1970. Vitaly Rubin, Sheremsky, those are figures, and Sakharov and the others whom we know. Sakharov actually was actually stood for the victims of this plane case. But But then just protesting together was a very rare thing. Can I ask you a question? When I read your article, you wrote that there were different stages and, and um, moments in the in the life of that movement. The so more more or less the, the years we uh, you mentioned are recognizable, like 68, 69, but those are the key dates for the human rights movement, right? You give us a, a very big number of letters written to, to like petitions and open letters written to different, uh, but this is also a, a trait of the human rights movement. Yes, of course, they learned, they learned. Uh, the learned from the human rights. Yes, I, I agree completely. Uh, the Jewish movement learned the methods from the human rights movement, and in early um, in early sixties, uh, or late sixties, early early seventies, when they when they learned and, and the kind of form formative period of time for the movement, the, there was a lot of copying there. But even the Samizdat was different. The, the only common shared Samizdat we had was the instruction from Vladimir Albert how to how to what to do when you had an interrogation or searches from your through house. That we all of us read. 
but they did not read the Jewish Jewish summers that. And now about the aims of the movement. You know, um, <laughs> we can say that people that idealized is Israel as as a, as an ideal state, and then they went to Israel and it was different. I would simplify uh, this. What was the declarative declar declarative mo uh, movement's aim? Repatriation to Israel. All the com on the documents and the slogans from Samizdat um, confirm this. What else did they want? What else did they want? Uh, they, what was their agenda? Is to have a national state uh, in a promised land, if we use the religious uh, language, to use their language, their uh, Jewish Jewish language, Jewish calendar um, for Soviet Union it was crucial to to have to raise your kids and grandkids in Jewish. So uh, a counter assimilation, like like a counter de assimilation, because assimilation was considered to be a, a very unfortunate thing, like a one of the sorrows of the Jewish nation. So not to fight for the ideals of other people. So for example, I don't fight, I don't want to fight in Afghanistan. I don't want to fight in, in um, Prague or today in Ukraine. I will protect my nation. So when these people came to Israel, did they get this? Yes. Maybe they didn't leave the same um, quality of life they wanted, but all of this claims they all did get because those aims were, were realized. So um, the dissident movement back then um, for their, their, their sacrifices were actually in vain because no, the, the state of uh, the rule of law was not imposed. Like Russia, uh, Soviet Union did not become the um, state with respect to human rights. So beautiful, wonderful people lay, lay their lives on the altars, went to pr pray the prison and so on, and they did not achieve their goals. So I would not equate that, uh, like, and uh, say that the Jewish Jewish movement had a mythology and it was not authentic. This was actually very authentic. Uh, Thank you very much. I believe we should have probably started with this speech of yours because you are talking about the reality and the at the level of interpretation. We might talk about the following, and I would like to invite Claudia to comment on that right now. So can the term, I understand identity, bicultural, um, you know, a mainstream and underground. I looked through your book several times and I looked at the terms that you use. Uh, you talk about the culture of Jewish dissident, the Jewish dissident movement and um, Jewish art and artists. So what stands behind these terms? Because we're, you're also bringing the art dimension into it. So my central question here, and it's a question I want to address to Marat as well. Every time I, when I read the word identity, I kind of stumble over it. And I wonder if we can bring everything down to one single identity rather than to an intersection of identities. I started by saying that the subject and the object of our, our research is very difficult to separate. But I do want to say that the word identity has shifted in meaning for me personally over the past 30 years. And there have been many different factors at play, at play uh, the external historical situation, my personal life. So I believe that there are certain different identities that are actualized at different times that are filled with different kinds of meaning. What do we do about it? What are we talking about now? Are we talking about the same thing when we say identity? Can we note down diff the different meanings of this word for different communities at different times in, in history? Thank you, Ola.
I agree that it's important not to unify this this term, this idea, this concept. And I think that it's great that this complexity is being brought to the forefront. For me personally, in my work, this spiritual search of the late Soviet Jews, the alternative movement, the Jewish movement, the intellectuals that Mikhail mentioned, that uh, of course was present not only in the capitals. When we look at the literature that studied the Third Temple or Luxembourg, he's from Kishinev, by the way, There were some interesting parallels and structures there, but in general, the spirit of underground subculture is very interesting to me, uh, and Jewish culture as part of that, whether it's direct or indirect um, kind of rebellion, resistance towards the Soviet government. And of course, we, it is obvious that Soviet Jews are a rather hybrid kind of uh, concept, if I may say so. These were, they were dissidents in the sense that they were anti-Soviet, but not to say that they were dissidents in the traditional sense. They were brought up on Russian literature, on um, writers like Hemingway and the Beatniks, Vichtwanger, uh, Interestingly, this is, is not about uh, modern jury, um, jury, but he's about the Bible and its reception in different contexts. So what I wanted to bring to the forefront is the complexity of these influences. Also, I would like to add to what Mikhail was saying. You were talking about whether they were dissidents or not dissidents. And I believe that we cannot forget that Soviet Jews had a, shared a feeling of additional stigma. Apart from them being dissidents, um, the, in the 50s and uh, with the, the reign of Stalin, there were these anti-Semitic uh, campaigns and the executions. This was very much alive and emotional in the collective memory of Soviet Jews. So I really wanted to underline this duality and the tragic nature of Jews in the Soviet Union. On the one hand, they were integrated into the Soviet Union. And in fact, uh, Jews were in, well, pretty much the most in intellectual part of Russian society. But there, at the same time, there was um, government-sponsored anti-Semitism, um, like everyday anti-Semitism. So I would like to respond to a question raised by Marat. I have a little chapter on the underground movement in my book, and it's closest to what Marat was talking about um, when he talked about indirect resistance, this kind of in-between place, if we simplify it. There are many authors that existed kind of at the border, at the brink of things said and unsaid. There was a lot of self-censorship, not only censorship, but also self-censorship. And I believe that your book about Boris Lutsky is similar, if it, kind of it's in the same vein because he was not an underground writer. He did, yes, he did have some as dad books, but his, um, this is also a very great contribution to the research on complexity, on the exploration of complexity. There are many things I want to say, many things I want to respond to, so thank you. I would like just a couple of words, says Mikhail, if Olga allows. One thing I want to say about anti-Semitism Natalia Vasilina Yuchnova, a wonderful professor that I was friends with. She was from Barnaul. Her parents were from there. They went to Tomsk University. And when her mother came from Tomsk University to Leningrad in the 20s, she was shocked by the anti-Semitism in Leningrad compared to Siberia. <laughs> 
A day ago, I was at a meeting with a professor about 95 years old from Hussein. He was in um, Moscow State University. He's a very intelligent person. He was a presenter and he said that when he, in the 50s he came from Baku to Moscow, he was taken aback by the anti Semitism. So when I start to analyze the reasons for this, for the, uh, for the Jewish movement, so there's, of course, the Zionist movement. Not, not everyone followed it, but uh, a lot of the ideology was taken from there, these symbols. There is usually three factors that are mentioned. So it's like Marxism, uh, two sources, three main points. So um, Jewish nationalism, Jewish kind of a re, uh, reconstruction of the Jewish nation. Of course, Shoah was a great uh, national trauma. The second is the re, like kind of like the rebirth of the um, state of Israel. And the third point is Soviet anti-Semitism. Depending on people's personal opinions, they attempt to choose either the first or the second or the third reason. And I think that the third true reason was Soviet anti-Semitism, where people were put into like into a situation where they saw that there's such a huge gap between them and the regime. And that was traumatic. Shoah is terrible. But at the same time, you know that the when you know that the government is fighting the same evil as you are, it's not as hard. But this government-sponsored anti-Semitism at all levels, education, career, domestic uh, affairs, this is something that can affect um, and I'm sure that uh, Jewish activists would say this as well. I'll, I'd like to circle back to what Mikhail was saying, but I, I'd like to uh, respond to Olga. I agree completely in that identity is an intersection. And that is what I write about in my book. It's an intersection of generations, contexts, Although it is very important to know that um, intersectionalism and intersectional uh, intersectional has a, also a narrow meaning in English language discourse. And yet, yes, we are talking about intersections. We can find a certain mainstream, something we can find something that unites these generations, something that unites these ti these timelines. So in that way, I agree with what Mikhail was saying. Context is everything. In understanding how this bookshelf was shaped and how these books shaped Soviet Jews, this cannot be done outside of the Soviet context. Because there are, of course, regional differences. There are also time differences, and yet, considering my research, the archives that I've gone through, anecdotal evidence, I, I believe it is possible to talk about certain common ground. For instance, in my family, in Ukraine, in the city of Khmelnytsky, in my uh, grandfather's family, who is a prosecutor, my uh, my grandmother, who is a teacher. We always had Fitzfanger on the bookshelf, Shol Malaychem, and so on. And of course, Rybakov, the heavy sand. And of course, it is true, you know, people, different people had different access to different things. 
may have had different interests. Um, it is evident that people in Moscow and St. Pete and Leningrad had access to more than um, people in the regions, although there are such, there are cases where um, somewhere in the regions there would be books that could not be found in Moscow or Leningrad. And um, the education, the background of the reader played a huge role especially when we talk about reading between the line and access uh, reading between the lines and accessing that esoteric layer and of course when we talk about certain bestsellers of the soviet epochs those books played a certain role in the lives of soviet jews however not many uh, Soviet Jews were able to um, identify how Jewish the 12 chairs or the golden calf of Ilfan Petrov really are. Not everyone was able to access that esoteric Jewish level. And what Klavdias talked uh, said about um, that space in between, it may be interesting to note the pairs that I mention in my book and in my other works. On the one hand, let's say we have Trifanov. I write quite a bit about him. Trifanov is uh, an iconic figure that created this language of the Soviet intellectual and for whom this um, idea of things unsaid played a big role. And Trifanov, uh, the Jewish matter was quite important. Trifanov survived and created in the Soviet context. But on the other hand, Klavdia talks about David Shreya Petrov, who's a refusenik and who is in direct um, contradiction with the government. So we have these two examples, two writers who explore similar issues, but approach them very differently depending on their position. Or for instance, my favorite Slutsky and Klavdia um, talks about how he indeed was in the official literary world, However, 80% of his poetry was not published. He knew this, this was a conscious decision, and yet Slutsky was a party member. And on the other hand, we have Jan Sutunovsky, who was a part of the Lianozova group, and he consciously excluded himself from this official world. So very different strategies. But what's interesting is that all of them had the same sources, the same Fitfanger, the same translations of Siddish. For, for some, these were not even translations. Some could read in the original. And if we think about the Jewish knowledge base, their knowledge of the Bible, about the um, Jewish scriptures, where did they get that? So here, the Master and Margarita is important, and Joseph and his brothers of uh, Thomas Mann and Fitzvanger, not so much the main content as the footnotes at the end of uh, his book. All of these things. And of course, there were a few who did have access to the source material itself. They could read in the original, something that they had left over. One thing I remember is, let's say it was 86, 87, my relatives in Kiev found um, a collection of works of Frug from the beginning of the century, and that was um, an absolute revelation. So intersections, these intersections are definitely there. We should take these different contexts into account. And yet I believe we can excavate this and create a kind of common picture, the image of a Soviet Jewish intellectual. 
I don't think that we need to count all of these books that they read. It's not a sociological uh, study. But my exploration is about what shaped that feeling of unity and community apart from those uh, rare situation when there was actually a community. Thank you so much, Marat. We have two comments and we are actually, we've gone beyond the time that we normally put uh, earmark for our own conversations. So thank you for, for those who are waiting in line to join the conversation. Please join us. Um, Eddie Valk first. Uh, Mr. Trachtenberg was before me. I'm I'm happy to give him the mic first. But this is a very interesting moment for the history of a Jewish nation. If it if it, if we manage to recreate this this typology of Soviet in, uh, Jewish intelligence, yeah, that that was uh, brought up in this banal literature of uh, Fechtwangler. And that would explain a lot of this current day situation of uh, Jews of uh, Soviet origin in uh, in Israel. But I I focused on what Dr. Vesa said on the anti-Semitism. And maybe as just my um, just as a comment, I wanted to share my my story because I became who I am independently from from anti-Semitism. I never experienced anti-Semitism in my life because I was a great uh, I was a I was a good soccer player. I was brought up on the in the streets through I mean, hooligans and uh, and uh, and I felt um, as uh, as as as, as accepted person. And I only encountered anti-Semitism much later and i remind you i i grew up in soviet uh, 50s and 60s in the kishinau the city of kishinau and and my formative uh, i was kind of what was important for me in my formative times was the very dumb and dull soviet uh, soviet reality like uh, song about the about the uh, brown button that was on, on the story or um, the national anthem of the Soviet Union when a normal person listen he hears um, uh, hears the words that the unbreakable um, breakable bond of the republics and normal pe people immediately realize that uh, they, it can be only unbroke, unbreakable if the republics are forced to stay with each other so it all all of this all of this um dumbness uh helped me to start start uh, my searches and i can and i discussed for many years this with my father in yiddish and he many years later he admitted to me that he tried to preserve me from getting into, uh, imprisoned and that's why he lied to me he didn't protect me in the end from the prison i, I was in prison but i i remember that he lied to me so in this idiocy uh, atmosphere and in, in schools and in press and TV and radio um, and school, uh, I started looking for uh, a way out. And what was my way out? To, to, to uh, talk to my father, to contradict my father and to, and to hear, to, the, to listen to the wisdom of my grandmother. And that was the beginning. That's how I realized that I'm not compatible with the thing that is called the Soviet Union because it is completely stupid, idiotic in, in all aspects of its existence. And that's how I started the thinking. And then when I was 16, 17, as, as Dr. Bigger said, anti-Semitism was omnipresent, but I was looking for a way out. I felt that I will die physically if I continue breathing these poisonous, this poisonous air of in my school and university, uh, and become a Soviet scientist. This was the worst I could imagine. 
the worst outcome. And so the Jew Jewish identity, Ju Judaism was my way out. And that's all I wanted to share now. Thank you. I had a question to all the three participants of today's conversation, discussion or presentation. Maybe two even questions. The first one, what is the place in the Russian Jewish literature? And I'm speaking about the 80s and 70s, the 80s uh, was taken by the uh, the books by the li Aliyah Library. There were in fact no no books of their own. There were those were the publications where 202 books were published by Jewish and non-Jewish uh, writers on the Jewishness. Jewish so that's my first question. And my second question is what's the place then in this Russian Jewish literature was taken by the by the works of the of those writers who wrote in Russian after moving to Israel. I don't know if you know this book. I'm not sure you can see it. No. Orientation in the terrain. It's the Russian. Uh, it's a, about Russian literature in Israel in the nineties. It did uh, arrive in the, in the Soviet Union in a very small numbers, but I think the this this is a special phenomenon in the Russian li Jewish literature. So those are two of my questions. Thank you. I'd start, and my answer is short, since. I researched the literary works. So the most interesting would be to mention that the library of Aliyah was um, was mentioned a lot. I opened the page from my monography now, and what's it's what is important is that the the that the uh, contents of that of those books from the Alia Library was very diverse. So the concept of Jewishness was a very diverse in that literature. For example, if I I see that David Schreier Petrov uh, he writes that the that the the books from uh, Singer, uh, Shabatinsky, Malik, and Kuris and Alterman in the library. This is a sign for me that this is a kind of uh, some kind of communion experienced by the Jewish culture, but also it's a sign of a polit political solidarity, which played a huge role. But it's also a sign of shared suffering, suffering shared with your ancestors, because that literature reflected a certain kind of history traced back to the biblical times and so it kind of reflected the continuity the line of inheritance and i'm not saying that this is a way of a myth it's, it's, a, it's a sign of mythology that i i see it as a cultural mythology but Oski says uh, speaks about the the bridge of desired of the of it's a literary genealogy that was that was created was creating this identity based on the texts so and i think that's uh, and and i think this is the li library uh, the role of the library of aliyah thank you michael michael for commenting on the wrong accent in my pronunciation of the word aliyah um and it's important for me that while reading those reading those texts as you marat you you had this cultural and sociological studies of the lives of those people, but also if you read the text, you can see a lot of mentioning a lot of the details of um, of that literature, and that was not just Jewish literature. That's the last point I want to make. There were a lot of European and Russian uh, authors. For example, Gerson Sherpetrov wrote that we re we read not just that literature, Jewish literature, but Gerson and Bakunin, and that's also very peculiar in terms of their impact. As for the book. And the book you mentioned, uh, and the Russian uh, Jewish literature of the 90s, Eli Valk, the, the book you mentioned, it was also published in the Society of Learning the Jewish, uh, Studying the Jewish Communities. 
but unlike the other books uh, um, uh, of the library of Aliyah, it's a large scale work and it was published later in Jerusalem when you come I'll be happy, happy to share maybe Mikhail and Marat know that book yes probably Mikhail knows no I don't know this book but I'm grateful I I'm th thankful to Elie Volk for mentioning this series. This is my first book. It was actually published in the uh, Library of Aliyah. And it was a big honor for me to be included in the series where Kersel Khadran, Khadram and, and, and Jabatinsky and others were published. It's, it was a rare luck. And I know that this the publication series was edited. Sorry, I didn't hear the name. This these books were important for the Jewish underground, but it, they couldn't reach everyone. A book that influenced me a lot was uh, the book of uh, Shlomo Avineri about the different strides in and air and directions inside Zionism. Very very good book that was presented in a very accessible form the history of Zionism. Of course, we read Jabotinsky and Getsu, but when I, when I met Shlomo Avina later on, I told him how important his book, even though he didn't write it in, in Russian, but it was translated and it was put on the, that library and it was the right decision, good call, because between us, the, the, the Jews who immigrated to Israel, we needed some basic foundational knowledge to put some orders, our, our understanding into order, because people, without that library, our knowledge was very chaotic, and that library was was very important. Um, Avineri was not in the Library of Aliyah. It was published in, in Library of Aliyah as well. Uh, okay. Because I had it as a different book. Thank you so much. I'm looking at the clock and I also see that uh, that we have more people want, wishing to join the discussion. First, so in which order? Olga Reznikova and Alexander Daniel. Olga. Yes, thank you. Yes, Olga was first. Thank you. I was taking notes of what you were sharing. And my question is probably to Claudia. What is the role of the folk music and the folklore and the cultural tradition and the collection of the folklore and and the music itself and the reproducing music? Like everyone had on their shelves the sisters, their sisters, the the, the, the vinyl disc. Maybe you, Marat and Klavtia, can you share what was the role of of the development or discovery of the folklores um, uh, of Jewish tradition. And uh, connected to that, uh, the, there's a question. You mentioned hetero, heterogeneous uh, genus character and the simultaneous nature of many, uh, many um, elements of the phenomenon we're discussing. So my question is, how do you, what is your take on, on the role of the criminal culture not the dissidents movement as a human rights movement, but for example, Odessa folklore. Which is not probably related to the Zionist movement, but related to the culture, the cultural discussion we're having now. What is considered, uh, if, if we're not considering the the science movement and identity, but like, for example, Severny, who was an underground figure who created this figure of this blood, blood, Jew, Jew. As well. This is a very interesting question that opens up a whole new uh, area. I can only respond from my own point of view. I think that uh, the question of collecting Jewish folklore can also be addressed to Michael because that was part of uh, Jewish studies 
you know, the Soviet Jewish studies, I mean, you know, this underground movement. As for me, I am interested in the process of the folklorization of Jewish culture. When we talk about the underground Soviet intelligentsia, So this kind of half idealized, half folklorized area. By the way, I write not only about literature, but also underground Jewish art. And I was Gauss, for instance, idealized uh, the Jewish settle and wrote his well-known, uh, made his um, well-known paintings. He wrote wrote on it in Hebrew. That was his kind of vision of the Jewish people like following Moses, but it was very folkloristic, kind of very kind of touristy in a way. And at the same time, we're talking, this is part of Jewish culture. Uh, and this proves my idea that it, Jewish culture is a very much a hybrid culture. It was kind of censored and banned by the Soviet government. And this, this idea behind it formed part of its identity. When we talk about the mythologization, uh, so when we talk about shtetl, this is post-Shoa, and this is part of Jewish culture around the world. I do have um, a chapter about how the Jewish Soviet revival was in the context of the post-war European and American revival of Jewry. And this process of folklorization that Ruth Ellen Groover wrote about in her book, she, she writes about this paradox about how um, Although there was an absence of, let's say, a living Jewish culture, there was such an interest towards Jewish culture. But I would like to hear more from Marat and Mikhail. Uh, we do have a very, very little time, and the, with, there's one more question. I'll just be very brief. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, talking about Fitbanger as a kind of trite scrap paper is, uh, I don't agree with that judgment. I do not think, I, I believe that he was unduly forgotten. And there's this whole process going on in uh, Germany, in German studies in America. And so Fitbanger is an important a layer that we do have to come back to. I would like to briefly return to the question of the library of Aliyah. I write about it quite a lot and in my other articles, as Mikhail has said, the Aliyah library has played a big role, but we need to bear in mind where this is happening. So, so it, um, it was available to us only as of the beginning of Perestroika, when we talk about the regions, when we talk about Ukraine, when we talk about anything outside of the capitals. So this was available in Moscow and capitals earlier, but not in the provinces. So Claudia and I were part of a group of researchers, an international group of researchers that studied this over the course of the past year and now there was a conference in Barilan that I attended a couple of weeks ago, and there are two volumes released in English and also a collection of articles in Russian. And what matters to me here is this kind of heritage. Those who wrote in Israel is kind of a succession and continuity. So they relied on the sources that were read in Soviet Jewish circles. So let's say the ideology is different if we talk about the Soviet Union and Israel, the Klavdi is showing this collection of articles, but the sources remain the same. Uh, with regards to music, that's a fascinating question. And these different 
paths and different times have shaped Soviet reality and culture. In my research on this bookshelf, I am very interested in the text. It is true when, that when we say that Soviet Jewish culture did exist, we have to take uh, the question of what formed their knowledge base quite seriously. But of course, there were also other things that influenced it. Are these the Barry sisters? Or is it D Dean Reed that sang the Hava Nagila? Uh, it was a record that was available in many households. It was his rendition that many, many people heard in their homes. And the last thing that Olga talked about, um, folklore, folklore after Shoah. And when we talk about the intersection between Soviet and European and American Jewry, uh, the role of Shalom Aleichem, the role that it played in the Soviet Union through cinema, this was also an iconic figure for American Jews. Even, even though that not everyone may have read. These parallels are very interesting. Alexander Daniel, please. I have a very concrete question, if I may. This may have been talked about before. Uh, apologies if it has. Um, I would like to know about a periodic um, Samizdat in the Soviet Union and about the way it was circulated. So the Samizdat per Jewish periodicals in the Soviet Union. Uh, we know about the journal Jews in the USSR that was indeed circulated among dissidents. What other Samizdat Jewish journals were widespread among the dissidents? I am particularly interested in the journal called Iton. As far as I'm aware, this journal had something to do with the Underground Zionist uh, Coordination Committee. The decision about publishing the newspaper, Iton, was made in June of 1969. And what does the word Iton mean? Iton means newspaper, translated from, Jew, uh, from Hebrew. And when Lesbian Jehuda was uh, reviving uh, the Hebrew language. He came up with the word iton, which means newspaper. The Trachtenberg also had uh, something to do with it. It was uh, disseminated, it was circulated. It was brought, it was taken around the Soviet Union Unfortunately, only the first issue was circulated. The second was seized by the uh, by the authorities. Um, if I may, I just want to make two brief comments. The first being the generation of young people. There's a theory of um, Professor Schmole Ettinger that our generation uh, were not um, kind of brought up by their parents. They were, mm, because their parents would work and they would be doing party work. Uh, and it was their grandparents who raised, the, who raised them. And it is their grandparents that spoke Yiddish to them, that instilled in them this Jewishness. And when we talk about the Soviet period um, and the li Alia library, there's a nuance. So it was brought in to the Soviet unions, uh, into the Soviet Union by Americans in their suitcases. 
And of course, these were seized, these books were seized. Uh, but the activists of Alia said, don't worry, these are going to soon appear on the black market. So and I would like to repeat my question. What other journals, other Jewish, Zionist, Samizdat periodicals were published in the USSR among dissidents? I don't know whether this applies to the dissident movement. But there's um, uh, there's Vic, the herald of the Jewish culture. And I, I think Mikhail could um, respond to that. And Ili is saying that in the 70s, close to the Perestroika, there was a journal um, or a newspaper uh, that was released after the census of 1969. It was called kind of your your native tongue, and I personally brought two hundred copies into Minsk to the Jews there, and it was disseminated uh, among the Soviet Union. Uh, yes, it would be interesting to meet Yosef Mendelevich because he was editor in chief of the two first issues of Eton, whom uh, that were mentioned by Mr. Valk. They, it included very interesting materials. Uh, the article of uh, Makishin, where he apologized on behalf of the Jewish nation for winning in the Six Day War and didn't and didn't lose in it uh, in for the sake of the whole progress of humanity. It was a very interesting magazine. This, we translated this material, we got this material from the French magazine and we translated it into Russian and Yosef put it into the Eton magazine. Uh, is Eton preserved in some collections, some libraries in original I think of the photos, it is possible to find it if we look for, for well enough. But what was published in, in Leningrad by uh, Len uh, Leningrad's Jewish Almanac? Um, Mikhail knows Leo very well that Almanac, I managed to find one or two copies. Uh, I presented it to Abel Teratuta. Of, uh, I can tell you where Eton magazine is preserved. It's in, in, in the archives of KGB, in the case files of the Riga process, two Leningrad processes, cases, and Chisinau case. All, it was all, um, all those magazines were part of the case files. And when the case was closed, I read actually those magazines. And if we're mentioning KGB, the Riga KGB department, when the Soviet Soviet uh, government left uh, Latvia in 1991. They, they took part of the archives in uh, to Moscow. So when I came to Riga archive, archive and talked to them in Lat Latvian, he was a very nice person. He he came to me from the archive and told me, "Dear Mr. Valk, the case of G G Gabriel Valk and Hershey Valk, Valk is here, but Elie Valk is not here." How you were? I, I was. I was the key criminal. But yes, the key criminal case, case files were actually to, taken to Moscow. Unfortunately. Thank you so much. It's a very uh, sad that we have to close and wrap up this conversation. Do you have some many key, like final, final comments? Yes, I want to say one thing. First of all, I, I, uh, I agree with Marat. I don't want to offend Fechtwanger. It's a it's an interesting uh, uh, writer, oh, in his own right. It's, but what Marat said about uh, Shachnovich, who, who uh, as anti-religious, anti-Zionist literature writer, it's a very toxic literature. Even Shachnovich, because someone between the lines could read that you actually need to read the sources and they went to the sources and they get, get, had their own opinion but most of the people who read Shachnovich actually hate the Jewish religion and that's that's what we have today the mass mass 
hatred of uh, Russian speaking Aliyah towards Jewish religion. They can they love Christianity, they can like um, Islam, but they hate Jewish religion. And this is the consequence of these toxic books like uh, like Shachnovich. They were actually translated to other languages, and Shachnovich was not the worst of them. And then those who followed him, they all they actually wrote not only the lies, but they were also not not specialists in their area. While Shachnovich was a specialist, but he just lied. I'm, I, I don't want to get this is a very long uh, a dispute that we can have on this, but I just want to say, yes, yes, this is a long discussion. It's a very layered and complicated debate you have, where we have to take into consideration the context and the personalities and we'll, we'll continue this conversation elsewhere. Yes, Klava, do you want to have, say something at the very end? Thank you very much. I enjoyed this very intense meeting and thank you, thank you Olga, and to everyone present and the, the, the participants and, and the audience. It was a very interesting. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, I would like to say a couple of words and to, to defend my, my idea about Fech uh, if if it's interesting to very shortly please yeah. first of all Fechtwange is the author of this sadly known book moscow 37 1937 and secondly Fechtwange wrote it to sell his books and his first book jew named zeus is a very low level literature it was published at the same time with Edinburgh's uh, book, Hura Jovenita, which is brilliant. Edinburgh, of course, sold out his talent for uh, to the Bolsheviks, and Fechtwanga didn't need even to sell him, himself to the to the communists because if, if had he been the real, he just wrote low-level operetta scripts, uh, his Spanish ballad, where he put in some kind of mythological Jewish figures. He just read uh, what he wrote was, he was, was, um, Uh, he wrote on just for the needs of the readers, basically. And there's a similar writer, Sholom Ash, who wrote a G uh, Yiddish version of uh, uh, War and Peace, uh, the trilogy that he wrote. Yeah, there can be a long debate about those kind of authors, but a writer, a true writer, is sharing what he has in his mouth. I, either how Frank Manning had it with Moscow 1937 or Shalamash with his Banal um, trilogy or has Frank Fanger. He was very pr prolific, uh, prolific. He wrote dozens of novels. And if you want to learn more about the Jewish war, you don't need to read Fechtwanger, you should actually read Joseph Flavius himself. So for a thinking and, and reflective person, Fechtwanger is not of much interest because everything, um, if, if you, you should better read actually uh, Brother Singer. You should actually read the books by the family of uh, Krasnovsky and the brother of Zinger. So you can actually find truth in the discussions and, and in, in real research. If you need a real opinion about Fichtwanger, you should read all of the, his novels, put them in historical context, and only then to and then turn to real Jewish uh, historical books uh, on those same events. That's all I wanted to say on those uh, on that topic. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone who joined this conversation today. And first and foremost to the speakers. Thank you for the discussion.
and see you at our next seminar. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.